Hey, I want to thank those of you who uh, joined us last year. I mean, last year. <laughs> yeah, some of you haven't been here since last year. But I want to thank you for joining the first of the year with us uh, last Sunday. Who was here last Sunday? What a powerful service we had last week. Yes. Holy moly. Holy moly. Yes. Woo. I mean, I couldn't have asked to start the, the new year any better than how God did it last That's week. Right. Okay, um, just to recap last week. I really felt on my heart that God wanted to strip away everything for the first service of the year. So we didn't have lights. We didn't have a sound system. We didn't have a projector. I just brought my guitar and everybody sat in the front here. And I really didn't plan anything. I did know there's certain things we wanted to do. But I tell you something. When you invite the Holy Spirit to take over, He will. We had a deep time of worship. We had prayer that was so deep, I believe people were touched. We had spontaneous worship, hula, that popped up around the room. That, that brought me to tears. I got to pray for some of you. My wife got to pray for some of you. We got others praying for others. And isn't that church? Yes. Yeah. Amen. It was awesome. Amen. Then I shared a little bit of, of a devotion I had um, the day after Christmas that I believe God was speaking to me about and how I believe that translates into a word for the church. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit. What I really enjoyed about last week, and we got to do this again one day, but at the end of service, we took communion, and we all took communion out of one loaf of bread. And it was great because everybody got to taste my fingers. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just kidding. I wore gloves. <laughs> but after communion, as a family, we all went up to the rooftop yes. of the parking lot, and we extended our hands, and... You know, I'm going to tell you the truth. This was kind of a crazy idea. And I was kind of nervous. But we went up there. And then even as we went up there, I thought, well, maybe I'll pray. My wife will pray. And somebody else will pray. And then we'll go home. I tell you, there's about eight or nine of you who prayed. Twice. And they were prayer for violence. They were prayer for the gangs. They were prayer for the youth. They were prayers for the kids. They were prayers for Kali. They were prayers for Merites. They were prayers for KPT. They were prayers for, for Powell Valley. They were prayers for downtown. They were prayers for the homeless. Somebody even prayed for all the ships that were coming into the harbor. You can pray for Donald Trump then. <laughs> we pray for the Aina. We pray for the land. We pray for its people. We pray for not only our church, but all the churches. What a way to start the year. Amen. And there is a word out of the book of Revelation. And, and you know what? I, I have to change gears this Sunday. Because my plan was to finish our made sermon series. But as we started to share as a small group on Wednesday night, the Lord dropped truths on us that night that I feel is too, way too important to let it go by. I think the whole church needs to hear more about Revelation 3. And I believe it's an important word for the church. And I may be redundant a little bit, repeating myself from last Sunday. And for those of you who are there on Wednesdays, are, are, are faithful, that come on Wednesday, you, you may have heard this, but it was, let me just tell you, that it was an honor being there with you on Wednesday to see God move the way He did. Because what He did was really drop some truths on us that I need, I need to share with the rest of the church. So today's message is called Comfortably Numb. <laughs> How many of you remember that title? <laughs> Comfortably Numb is a hit song for the rock band who? 
Pink Floyd. They're known for their what? Psychedelic lyrics and music videos. And part of the song's lyrics go like this. Hello? Hello? No, it's not the Adele one or the Lionel Richie one. But the Pink Floyd song goes like this. Hello? Is anybody there? Just nod if you can hear me. Is anybody at home? And then it goes on to say, this is not how I am. I have become comfortably numb. I believe this is a warning for the church because this lyric reminds me of Jesus Christ's warning to the church of Latos. Uh, uh, what is it called? Laodicea. Laodicea. When you read <laughs> Revelation 3, verses 14 through 22, when you hear that song by Pink Floyd, I think, man, they must have read this verse before writing this song. You read the rest of the lyrics, it's obviously talking about drugs. But, it's very relative. Mike, can you turn the reverb off of my voice? It's very relative to what Jesus is saying to the church of Laodicea. Because maybe they weren't taking drugs, but they were being lulled to sleep. They were being lulled to a numbness that separated them from their God. And if there's any warning from Jesus to us as a church in 2017, it is this. Do not be lulled asleep. Now, you might be asking, what lulls us to sleep, Pastor? We come to church. We worship. We attend Wednesday Bible study. We do our devotions every day. Why did I just go into a... <laughs> what is that guy's name? Anyway, but, but this is my point. It's those exact things that will lull you to sleep. It is the familiarity of what you become accustomed to. <laughs> you see, the, the devil doesn't mind you coming to church. He doesn't even mind you reading the Bible. He doesn't even care if you do your devotions or show up for Bible study. He only minds when you start engaging with those things. He only minds when you start practicing those things. You see, the act of doing those things are, 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 are no concern of Satan's. Because there's many people that follow through and go through the motions of those things, but are not engaged in those things. And if you're not engaged in those things, then those things will not affect your heart. Those things will not change you. Those things will not transform you. Because once they do, then you're a threat. <laughs> See, you've got to press on the gas to make the car go. Satan's only concerned... When you start living, living out the motions that you've come accustomed to. Mm -mm -mm. Let me read from you, for you from uh, Revelation 3, 14, 16, 11, tell you what I'm talking about. <coughs> and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, this is Jesus talking. How I, how I know this? Is the, the letters are in red. <laughs> and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. Verse 15, I know your works. Everybody say works. works. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. 
I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm I need, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit. I can say that in church because it's in the Bible. <laughs> I will palu. I will bar falani. That's a word I mean. I will, I will blow chunks. I will spew. I will throw up. I will hurl you out of my mouth. And I stopped in my tracks when I read this because I started thinking about the things that make me vomit. I'm stirring it up today. I hope you didn't eat breakfast yet. You guys like eat something? No. I don't know whose breakfast is this. Not mine. Not mine. <laughs> and I started going down the list of what makes me nauseous so much that I would want to hurl. I think of sour milk. I think of rotten fish. I think of uh, before I knew Christ, I think of drinking too much tequila. <laughs> <laughs> to the point where I just smell tequila nowadays. It is like a gag reflection. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and I started listing them all out. And you're probably listing them out in your brain right now. And then I said, why God? Why? Because it's these people who are lukewarm that doesn't agree with his body. Things we throw up are things that, that don't agree with our body. Our body rejects things that, that are a danger to it. And part of the defense of keeping your body healthy is to throw up things that will make it sick. So Jesus is saying, for those of you who are lukewarm, I need to throw you up because you are a danger to the health of the body of Christ. Amen. So if this is a warning to us, our warning is not against your passion, but your lack thereof. Jesus got my attention. And you know what else got my attention was this. And you know God, he's so good in, in how he lays your life down in the order it, he does. Because he does so many things, if not everything, I think everything, intentionally. Because everything is kind of linked together. So right before this, a few weeks before reading this verse, and now I'm pondering. Now you got to imagine me pondering. I'm pondering. And I think of an incident, and I talked about it last Sunday, but I want to repeat myself. I, 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 I brought up an incident in where my wife and I were singing a song. We love to sing karaoke. And I love to sing with my wife. Because I've sang professionally for, what, 30 years. And I've never had that much of a chance to sing together. So when we get a chance, when we go, we sometimes we have church events where we go out and we have a karaoke night with us and or we go down to that place in uh, Mapuna Puna. What is that? What's that place? Henry Louis. Henry Louis. You know, Cheryl, Mike, you know, we'll sing a mop over there. Jamie and I, once in a while, we like to, we like to go and we like to sing because there's the one song that we like to sing together and it's called The Closer I Get to You. You know that one? Yes. Donnie Hathaway and uh, yeah. Roberta Flack. Roberta Flack. Yeah. Closer I get to you, the more you make me. Well, anyway, the last time we sang um, this song, somebody videotaped us. And I that's why you got to be careful when you're in Pastor. Everybody videotaping all the way around. <laughs> but you guys have nothing to worry about. But somebody videotaped us, and we were watching the video, and it kind of went like this. My wife was singing her part. 
the closer I get to you. And her eyes are all sparkly. The more you make me see. And she's going like this to me, and, and she's going like this, and the heart is gushing towards her kuku'ipo. Beautiful. Finding you more and more. Your love has captured me. And then my part, and then this is me in the video. Over and over again, I try to tell myself that we can never be more than friends. And all the while inside, I knew it was real. Now everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes, close your eyes. Go, 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 close them. The way you make me feel. Now, if you imagined in your mind what I looked like singing that song, you would think I would be the way you make me feel. <laughs> but I wasn't. My body language was this. And my wife said, do you even feel the song when you're singing it? <laughs> and it wasn't to knock my love for her, but she brought up an important point. She said, I think you've been singing for so long that you're just singing. That you do it so much that you know the song so well that you just sing it. Technically. And when I read this, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, so then because of you are lukewarm I, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I thought, my God, that is me in the singing world. I've become so familiar with a song. I've become so familiar with the lyric. I've become so familiar with each note I want to sing that it just comes out naturally and you know maybe it sounds good but there is no engagement in the lyric and there's no projection of that love which that song was meant to project yes we can become low to sleep just going through the motions we know how to wake up on sundays and come to church we know how to sit here and take notes. We know how to listen to Pastor Sam's message. We know how to read the... We know how to sing the songs, especially if it's the familiar ones that we do all the time. We know how to open our Bibles. We know how to do our journaling, soap, sing the scripture, observation, uh, uh, application, and prayer. We know how to do our devotions, but that is not enough if you're just going through the motions. you got to feel the lyric. you got to project the lyric for what it was meant for. Yeah, amen. Good one. Come on, somebody. Yeah. I hope I'm not just preaching to myself this morning. Good one. How you preach it. Come on. <laughs> when we read on in the next verses, it becomes clear. Have you ever been in a relationship? And this is the scary part. Maybe a hurtful relationship. Maybe a, a relationship that was filled with abuse. You know what I've learned through my relationships? Which were too many, but very intense. My relationships. <laughs> I've learned this. I'd rather have you passionately scream at me in anger did not say anything at all. Because at least I know that if you're screaming at me in anger, there's still something to fight for. There become a time in one of a relationship I was in where it just came to, I don't care anymore. You can do whatever you like. It doesn't bother me any more. Jesus is warning us about that sin. He's saying, I'd rather have you yell and scream at the top of your lungs that you don't understand what I'm doing. I went through that in California. I, I felt the call and I moved my kids, my wife, we were young and we moved to California. I had no idea pretty much why, but we had to go there. And I know why now, but 
as I was in it, I didn't know why I was there. I was doing music for, for like 18 years of my life. I didn't know why I was there. And I had to work like a hard morning job. I had to get up every day and drive two hours in 405 traffic from Torrance all the way up to Westwood, which is by UCLA. And I thought to myself, in 405 bumper to bumper traffic, why have you brought me here, God? And it got to such a frustration where I rolled up my windows, turned the aircon on, blast the music, and I started just yelling at him. What in the world am I doing here? It was so nice. On the beach at Waikiki. My life was so simple. I'd sit on a stool. I'd play songs for three or four hours. I'd go up to my wife and kids and enjoy the beauty of this Aina. And I thought, why did I leave that to be sitting in 405 traffic, smog, beaches I can't even swim in because of the kelp. <laughs> the kelp that wraps around your leg. And it came to a boiling point where I cried out to God, what am I doing here, God? I might go back home. This sucks. Where I belong, huh? And you know, when I read this, God is going, I'd rather you do that. Because there's still something to fight for. You see, God just wants you to be alive in Him. Somebody say amen. 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 He wants you to be alive in Him. This is to me one of the most dangerous places we can be in our walk with Him. It is a hard road back if you do reach this numbness. But like all relationships, the longer you don't feel, the easier it is to fake it. How many of you know that one? And the easier it is to be deceived by Satan and other people. But the danger is not with them. It's with our self deception. When we read on in verse 17, Jesus says to the church, Because you say I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich. And white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve or ointment that you may see. You see what Jesus is saying here, you have been comfortably numb for so long, but you know you've got to put on this appearance of being a good Christian, that even though you don't feel anything inside, you carry it out with your actions, which is just empty gestures to the Lord. You've come to make yourself believe just because I have a good job, just because I have a good position, just because I have a comfortable house and a nice car and uh, all the money coming in in the world, I don't really need God anyway. And God is saying, uh-uh-uh. <coughs> I don't care how much money you got. I don't care what position you hold. I don't care what car you drive. I don't care what house you live in. Without me, you are naked. You are poor. You are blind and you are deaf. You've deceived yourself. And you've been deceived because of your lukewarmness. It's not even a word, but I just made it up. This church 
Laodicea was going along thinking there was something that they were not. God's warning to us this year is to turn from that. Here's another important thing you've got to know when I'm reading these verses. Did you know that Jesus is talking to a church? <laughs> He's talking to believers. He's not talking to the unsaved. This is a church he's talking to. So this message, you might be sitting there and like, yeah, man, my brother-in-law, he should know this. <laughs> no, no, no. This message is for you. Amen. This message, this warning from Christ is for us, the church, the believers. But here's where it got real for me. As I was kind of swimming in my frustration of this past year, my thoughts resemble many I talked to over the past 2016. It was pretty much a resounding 2016 thought, right? How many of you agree with me? Yeah. Now, there's, you have your reasons, right? The world has its reasons, but I have my personal reasons uh, why it was challenging. It was very frustrating, to be honest. For me spiritually, for me occupationally, for me in my family, for me personally, for me... Down the line, there were challenges on every aspect of my life. And did I get discouraged? Yes, I did. Did I hold on to Jesus though? Yes, I did. And when I contemplated these scriptures... This is the part where it got real for me. Check this out. When I read verse 19, it changed everything. Not only does this give me hope, it gave me purpose. Who wants hope and a purpose in 2017? This is what God is saying to me, to us for 2017. It's a loving warning, but it's also a template for truth. That we can live by this year. It says this. And Jesus finally says this. To the church of Laodicea. He says. I correct and discipline. Everyone I love. <laughs> I correct and discipline. Everyone I love. So be diligent. And turn from your. Indifference. The word in the New Living Testament says indifference. The meaning of indifference is numb, not caring one way or the other. Turn from your indifference. The New King James Version says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. <coughs> I want to look at what the Amplified Version says because it really describes it to the T. Read with me this. Th this is the same verse. Amplified Version. <coughs> Those whom I dearly and tenderly love. Isn't that beautiful? I don't care what you went through in 2016. You are dearly and tenderly loved by your God. And it goes on to say, I rebuke and discipline, showing them their faults and instructing them. Woo! So be enthusiastic and repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking, and your sinful behavior seek God's will. Now when, I think it was Jan that brought this translation up to us on Wednesday night, when I read this version of verse 19, I was already affected by the other translation. But when I heard this translation, it opened my eyes to a truth that you all need to hear for 2017. Are you ready? So the first truth 
that, that we learn from this verse for us this year is number one, let God love you. Let God love you. Now, you might think, duh, of course. Of course I'm going to let God love me. That's what he does, right? He's a love. He's a lover. He loves me, so I'm going to, of course I'm going to let him love me. <laughs> but if we really think of it, if we really, truly allowed God to love us, we would accept everything that comes with it. We like the salvation. We like the grace. We like the forgiveness. And we like the eternity thing. We all do, right? Amen? Amen. But if it was that easy, why do we have such a hard time fully accepting and surrendering His ways for us? Part of loving Him is surrendering to everything He has for us. How many of you agree with that? I don't know about you, but for me, it's a truth that we don't think about too often. Because this is why, and, and, and this is why I'm going to tell you, uh, that if you raise your hand and say, I do let, how many of you say, I, I let God love me? Trick question. Put your hands down. <laughs> How many think it's hard to let God love you? Oh, that's good. And when I read this on Wednesday night, there was a truth that popped in my mind that was staggering to me. And I thought to myself, of course I let God love me. But then... I processed in my brain, okay, if I really did, then everything in my life would be surrendered to His will. Everything in my life would come under His jurisdiction and I would allow Him full reign of my whole life. You mean you don't let God have full reign over your own life? No, and neither do you. So stop lying to yourself. Because love, check this out, because love, God's love now, is married to God's discipline. Check this out. God's love is married to God's discipline. We cannot say we allow the fullness of God's love into our life if we can't say we allow God's full discipline in our life we rush to the love part but we run from the latter but if the two are married we must accept and surrender to both if we do not we do not and we will not see the fullness of what he called you and I to be you will not experience and feel what it is to be alive in Christ God wants the best for you, but you cannot experience the best if He doesn't clean the fish. <coughs> we can't experience the richness of silver unless the silver is refined by fire. Mm. <sighs> I love this story. There was a group of ladies that visited a silversmith. And I use this story a lot, so if you heard it, just bear with me. And they had a Bible study, and this women's Bible study said, Hey, you know, it talks about refining silver and blah, 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 and the Bible says blah, blah, blah. We're going to go over there, and we're going to go visit a silversmith. So the women's uh, Bible study went over there, and they were watching the silversmith, and he was refining the, the silver over the fire, and it was all melted, and it was beautiful. And, and, and he said, you know, I have to burn it because all of the, the impurities rise to the top and then I start to clean the you know to take all the impurities out of the silver we burn all the impurities out of the silver and he starts to stir it and whatever he does with it and the one of the ladies asks excuse me silversmith how do you know it's pure the silversmith says when I can see my own reflection in it how do we become who we are called to be by the Most High God is when He 
can see his reflection in you. Amen. And not, it's not going to be by running from his discipline. It's going to be by running into the refining fire and allowing him to walk through it with us. Somebody say amen, amen. to that. So number one, let God love you. Number two, let God discipline you. I rebuke and discipline, showing them their faults and instructing them. Woohoo! This is a dangerous prayer. And I'm continuing. I, I prayed this to God. That's why my 2016 was crazy. He was showing me things through his discipline and through his love for me. My faults. There were things he brought up in my life this past few months that I could not imagine I still dealt with. But he wants the best for my marriage. He wants the best for my walk with him. He brought up things that I had to really look in the face. A lot of us run from his love because we don't want to look at ourselves in the face. I don't want to look at that God, but you got to look at it so I can take it from you. I am refining you into the best Sam you can be, but it hurts God. I know, but I am the ointment. I am the salve. When you repent and turn from it, I'm going to be there to put ice on your awi. I'm going to be your spiritual back team, spray them on your boo-boo. He is your ointment. Not alcohol, not drugs, Amen. and not anything else that we use to medicate. He's the ointment. But let him discipline you. I have a bad habit of parking in the wrong place. He refined me this past week. <laughs> I pulled up on King Street, ran into uh, Easy Music, forget some guitar strings, was looking around a little bit. No concept of what time it was in the day. I walked out of Easy Music on Thursday. My car was gone. <laughs> and you know what makes it worse? You know what makes it worse? A six-year-old telling you that. I walked out on the sidewalk. I walked out on the sidewalk and I'm going, Oh my God. He towed my car. Frustrated. Almost angry. But trying to just pray and trying to just keep it cool because I'm in public, I'm a pastor. <laughs> but then all you hear is this. Oh, daddy, where I call it? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Shh. Uh, <laughs> no, the car was never here. We're going to just walk today. We're just getting exercise. No, no, daddy, I call it right there. Where was I call daddy? Somebody steal a car. Did somebody steal a car, Daddy? Shh. Did the cops come and take your car, Daddy? Oh no. There's simple irresponsibilities that a God is illuminating in my life that I gotta get rid of because He loved me. I gotta pay more attention to what time it is. Tree turning is not towing cars down the King Street. <laughs> and except, and this is such a good picture of when God starts to discipline us, because the first thing we do is we try to blame somebody else, right? First thing out of my mouth. You see, you guys. If you guys wasn't fooling around so much inside that we would have been out of here in time, in the car and going home already. <laughs> God is like, no, 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 no. This is you, brother. You the daddy. Own it up, brother. You gotta own it. Because God is telling me if you don't own it, you gotta give it away. So if you own it, just give them to me, brother. That's right. So I had to own it. I had to swallow my pride. And I had to make the hardest call I ever had to make in my life. Hi, Jamie. Uh, yeah, the car got towed. Okay, I'll meet you at Zippy's. 
But God will do that to us because he loves us and he wants the best for us. Let him discipline you. If you look through the whole Bible, it'll tell you. From Proverbs to Hebrews 12, 5 through 6, it says this, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges. Every son whom he receives. Now check this out. In Hebrews, this totally and directly relates to Re Revelation 19. This directly talks about family type of discipline. Biblical family discipline. For you parents out there, this one's for you. God has placed upon parents the responsibility of disciplining their children. And here, the Bible uses three Greek words that uses the three different kinds of discipline we are to use on our children. Parents, are you writing this down? The first is chastening. The Greek word is paideia, which means to instruct. That's the first type of discipline, to instruct your keiki to do the right thing. The second type is rebuke. The, the Greek word for that is elegcho. Eleg cho, which means to verbally reprove. Yeah? So that's like one verbal uh, warning, verbal even scolding a little bit. Huh? That's what a rebuke is. Okay? The third one is scourges. The Greek word is mastigo, which means to. <laughs> the technical definition is to flog. <laughs> but in this context, the, it, it means in this context a sensible now everybody say sensible. sensible a sensible physical discipline it doesn't mean a beating it doesn't mean close fist in the face it doesn't mean a belt that draws blood it just means a little Yes. Yes. Now the order in which this scripture lays it out is the order in which the parent should use. Okay? Why I'm talking about this? Because it has everything to do on how God disciplines us. The order in which these words are important. All discipline must be given with instruction first. There are times when instruction includes verbal rebuke. Because sometimes all we need to do is give instructions to our kids. Okay, Dad. All right. All right, I got it. That's all we need. Amen to that. But if, if it doesn't work, then you might need to use a verbal rebuke. Yeah. Not to degrade them, but to remind them and to warn them that their actions have consequences. And for some kids, that all it, that's all it takes for that child to repent and obey. But then, there are those other kids. <laughs> like me. <laughs> Who are disobedient and rebellious that need it to progress to the mastigo'o or the sensible lickings. I was hoping for more of a laugh right there. And in all cases, the Bible requires the parents to seek the Lord, allowing Him to show what is happening in each child's heart and in which, which discipline to use which is appropriate. Now when we read about this, we see how God disciplines us. Where do we get our instruction? From the Word of God. Now sometimes when we don't want to follow the Word of God in our life, there's times where your car gets towed. 
And God gives you a little warning of rebuke verbally. Boy, you know that's not right. But then there are other times when it becomes public or tragic. The means God may use or allow to get your attention. Not because he doesn't like you or wants to punish you or wants to give you lickings or wants to shove your nose in the doodle like one poppy. Some of us think that. God, why are you doing that? No, it's because he loves you. And he wants you to turn from your indifference. And the word turn back to God is what? The word repent. So if love is married to discipline, and discipline causes pain, which is what we all want to run from. How many of you like pain? Not me. But in God's case, sometimes a little pain is necessary to bring you to repentance. So if we keep running from the pain, then we keep running from God. And I'm not saying this to be, what is it called, morbid or a masochist or anything. It's, it's to allow his correction. And sometimes we need to allow him to, to, to paint our dragon red. So if love is married to discipline, and discipline equals pain, pain equals repentance. But here's the good part. Repentance will lead to transformation. Repentance is that door that we open when we repent. We open this door and now we allow God to come in to transform you. Who wants to be transformed? Then you need to allow God to love you, which is married to discipline you, which is to cause a little bit of uncomfort so we can repent and open the door for change in 2017. Yeah, yeah. Amen? And he's not talking about regular type of repentance. In these words, in these different uh, translations of the Bible, one says zealous, one says authentic, one says enthusiastic repentance. It's not one of these, okay, I sorry then, God. All right, you got, you got me. Okay, sorry then. No. He's talking about the kind of repentance that, that takes every bit of your being... Every thought, every emotion, every bodily function going, Lord, I repent of this. Please take it. I don't want it anymore. How many of you know what kind of repentance that is? That's what he wants. And that is the door that opens God Amen. to you. Believe me, I know this. Turn from your indifference, God is saying. Your whole being will follow. How do I know? Read on. So repent is number three with enthusiasm. Number four, change your inner self, your thinking and your behavior. That will only come after steps one, two, and three. If we continue to read, and I'm going to close with this. And finally, the promise he gives those who receives the love, but also accepts the discipline, the ability to hear his voice with knowledge of his will for you. Number five, seek God's will for your life and go. <coughs> How many of you want to know God's will for your life? How many of you want to know God's will? Amen. We all say we want to know God's will. Amen? Amen? We all want God's will. We all want God's will. We all want this number five from Pastor Sam's notes. Yeah. But... How often we always say, I want to know God's will, but I don't. I can't hear him. I don't know what he wants for me. I just want to know what he wants for my life. And, and we've all been in spots like that. And I really believe, honestly, in my heart, that we've come to that point because we're not willing to go through one, two, three, and four. I believe that in this verse, he puts, know the will of God at the very end. Because I don't think we can hear God's voice 
unless we allow him to love and discipline us. I don't think we hear God's voice if we don't repent and open the door to him. Because after, like Ali said on Wednesday, after we empty ourselves of ourselves, after we are emptied of us, then we can hear him. And when we empty ourselves through repentance and allowing Him to love and discipline us, then we can hear clearly the voice of God and His will for us. There are true riches we can partake. Maybe it's not of gold, maybe it's not of fine clothes, but there are eternal riches that matter way more to God and to His kingdom. Their lives Abundant life. How many of you agree with that? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Then all things would be added to you. He is calling. He is knocking at your door today. But only obedience and the willingness to surrender and repent will open that door for you. God says here, look at me. I stand at the door. I knock. If you hear me call and open the door, I'll come right in and sit down to supper with you. But here's the promise for you in 2017. He says, conquerors will sit alongside me at the head table, just as I, having conquered, took the place of honor at the sight of my father. That's my gift to the conquerors. When we follow God's love plan, he comes inside to make you a conqueror. What does that mean, Pastor Sam? That means sadness conquered depression conquered anger conquered addiction conquered spirit of poverty conquered indifference conquered his final warning to the church and the word for us this morning comes from revelations 3 22 and he says are your ears awake listen listen to the wind words the spirit blowing through the churches so what is the word being spoken in the wind blowing through the churches beware of being lulled to sleep with a familiar song be alive with all your feeling all your emotion let god love you let god discipline you repent with authentic zeal with all of you change your inner self your thinking, and your behavior, then seek His will, and you will find it, church. You will find it in 2017. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand. But I want to thank you for being here today, and I hope this word touched your heart, and I hope it encouraged you and inspired you to live your life according to the word of God Amen. this year. A few announcements before we close today. Can I say congratulations to two who got baptized in our church yesterday? Can you give a big round of applause and thanks for Georgine and Jasmine. Where's Jasmine? There's Jasmine right here. They both got baptized yesterday and I want to thank all of you who came out and enjoyed the Ono food with us as well. It was, it was so Ono, but it was so cold. Here's some other announcements for you. Next week, Sunday, please invite some friends over. We have a couple that will be uh, giving a special message to us next week. We have Tisha from The Fish, my partner in the morning. But she'll, she's going to bring her husband, who is a powerful speaker as well. His name is Jason LaFelt. And they're going to come to encourage you next week, Sunday. And it's going to be awesome. Come and join us Wednesday, 6.30 at 888 EVLA as well. We need uh, you to come and learn about the the design and we're going to finish it up with the last two on wednesday so come and join me and uh, worship speaking about worship we are calling out to all who want to help our worship we need we need at least two or three more people to help us in the morning and all we're asking is maybe once a week uh, to come now, um, I'm going to just lay it out there because i got to give you the details because if can, can. If no can, no worry. So what we're asking for is two or three more people to come once a month to show up at 645 to help set up the sound and the lights. Uh, we're in desperate need of that. Also, if you want to be a part of the worship team, which includes the techs and the multimedia 
and uh, the singers and the musicians. If you want that, we have a short meeting for all worship team people right after church, right here in the theater. So if you can stick around after that, that will be great. Also, uh, what else? That's it. Okay. We love you. Leo, we love you. Valerie, thank you for coming. Oh, they went outside already. But join us, uh, join us Wednesday. And we'll see you next time.